All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. It is uh, December 6th, 2021, and it sure feels like December, finally. Uh, some good cold weather to keep the little warm buggies and things away. I have cold weather in the winter. Uh, so I am Carl Hawkinson. I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension, Hennepin County, and I coordinate uh, this Ecological Service Livestock Network. <clears throat> And today, I think we're going to have a really interesting show uh, with Arlo Hark from Cannon Valley Grazers. Uh, but before we get into that, um, I'd just like to say a few words. Uh, this uh, Ecological Service Livestock Network, I coordinate with the Sustainable Farming Association. And really, uh, in a word, it's all about um, returning livestock to the land, our, our savanna and prairie landscapes have been missing livestock and uh, they're sick because of it. Uh, here you can see some pictures. We've been working mostly with the people that have goats. Um, and here we are coming up today. Uh, and if you go down a little bit on the webpage, there's some past summaries. I'll just take a look here quick. Uh, this is, okay, that's 2019, been a while. I said we haven't been too active lately, but we had an awesome silver pasture camp okay. up at Jane Jewett's place and others. There's Kent Silver. He's one of our, our champions and SFA uh, senior advisor, I think they call him. <laughs> He's a good guy. Silver Pasture Resources. Uh, here's an event in Washington County. A lot of the folks that are catching on to using livestock are public land managers. Dakota County and, and uh, Ramsey County, Hennepin County, uh, and Washington County doing great work. Uh, here's some racing work we did in the winter. Stripping buckthorn in the winter. Somebody's got to mute, please, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, Could somebody mute, please? Somebody in our group buys from, from this. From this you, yeah. Somebody needs to mute, please. Thank you. It's either a laser. I think with the brown around the edges, it might be a laser <laughs> or a die cutter. There's a something like that. Carl, if you want to give me co-host capabilities, I yeah, can, I think you can go double can mute check. everybody. Yeah, <laughs> or you can probably do that you too. Do it. Uh, uh, let's see. Where do I go? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, somebody was talking there. You got to mute, please, until I figure out how to do it. Uh, da -da. Anyway, okay, we're good. Anyway, there's some of that. Here's uh, uh, Munch Bunch and their program. So there's some good resources there. I just want to go through this quickly to see what's out here. Resources and handouts. NCAT as an agri-solar clearinghouse, an agroecological agro vision of perennial ag, all kinds of good stuff. Some things from Sherry Nolden, she's a, uh, uh, been working in Wisconsin for a long time and all this you can check out and uh, then here's some projects. Sheep in the sun, solar grazing with Lexi Hain. And we have uh, uh, solar panels, we'll be talking about that today. Sheep under solar panels. How about this one? Earth's wild grazers can't keep up with the effects of nutrient pollution. Really, really interesting article. One of the things we talk about is how nitrogen saturated our landscapes are and uh, how that is not good. Diversity land work is another goat uh, operation and, and what they've been doing. Here's a really fascinating one. Siberia's Pleistocene Park bringing horses back to restore uh, some landscapes way up north. So anyway, cool stuff there. Um, but as I was mentioning, it's really about, um, stop, share, uh, returning livestock to the land, not just to uh, bring back some diversity to the corn and bean world out there, but also, um, again, primarily as tools for land management. And uh, uh, the more I look into this, the more it's, I find it really fascinating. And uh, the landscapes around the Metro here, uh, if you see the old paintings uh, and even some of the early pictures, there, it was much more open. The native uh, Lakota, they used fire. And if you think of all the elk and bison and beaver, and all kinds of things eating all the time. We call it uh, graze obligate landscapes. 
and you take that away and uh, you have the mess that we have now with uh, <clears throat> buckthorn and garlic mustard and, and uh, pretty unhealthy sick woods. They look nice, you drive by, hey, look at the pretty woods, but uh, if you, you know, it, it's, it's not the case. So uh, we hope to develop businesses. We've got four of them and there's many more that are seem to be doing really well, enjoying their work and um, uh, making money with their goats. And uh, uh, so it, we think it's a lot of win-win. And then now the new thing with solar, uh, of course, we don't want 10 acres of gravel, nor do we really want 10 acres of mowed grass out there in farm country. So that's some of the background of the organization and, 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 and this network. And uh, Brianna, uh, not Brianna, uh, Katie, if you want to say a few words about SFA. For sure, yeah. Uh, so Sustainable Farming Association, oh, I'm Katie Federal, sorry. Um, Sustainable Farming Association is a statewide nonprofit. Uh, and we're kind of concerned with anything regarding sustainability and regenerative ag practices, um, whether that be, we do primarily education and um, this networking group fits right into our vision of farmer to farmer networking, um, folks learning directly from each other in the field or on the Zoom screen sometimes. Um, and we have state, uh, different chapters around the state so that like we can have people in geographic regions connect um, around issues that are important to them as well. Uh, so yeah, primarily focused on education and supporting um, partners like Car Carl here at the U um, to expand um, development and research and exposure to all these um, different practices or, or programs getting running. So we're a membership-based organization, um, but a lot of our programming is free and accessible to anyone regardless of membership. Uh, we do have, I want to put in a plug in for the annual conference in February and the Midwest Soil Health Summit in March. And both of those events will have um, a, sessions that are geared towards livestock folks, um, landowners, um, and all that good stuff. And if you're a member, you get a discount. So I'll throw um, those links in the chat. But yeah, I think that's what I got. And I'll let Carl and Arlo take okay. it back. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, it's a really great organization. Uh, they focus on networking. And it's such an important thing. And uh, soil health is one of their big deals. And uh, as, as we all know, I think that we be Long story short, we realize that soil is biology, not geology. Um, and uh, uh, we've been beating our soils to death for 100 plus years. One other thing SFA is really involved with is this new world of silver pasture um, and some really interesting things going on there. So with all that as a little background and get you all warmed up, um, and there's the annual conference in the chat. Thank you, Katie. So today, uh, Arlo Hark is here and his partner, Josie uh, Topol was not able to join us, unfortunately, but uh, I'm sure he can speak to what he's doing fully. Uh, they have Cannon Valley Grazers, uh, the raising sheep, and uh, they use, also use the sheep for, uh, <clears throat> for the things I've been talking about, land management, and they've been getting work uh, with sheep under solar panels, which is such a perfect fit. And uh, a lot of the work we've been doing in this network has been mostly around goats, because again, these woods are so choked with brush and, and stuff. And goats are, are more primitive grazers or actually browsers. The way to think about it is they look up to eat sort of thing. <laughs> and they will eat all kinds of crazy things. Um, and uh, once we get some of these places opened up, maybe we can bring the sheep in there who like more of the grass and so forth. So. Um, my dream, our dream is to have the, the Metro uh, and many more businesses uh, having animals graze these areas routinely and have people be uh, knowledgeable and okay with that. Um, it's gonna take a little effort, of course. And it's not gonna have overnight, but uh, why not produce milk and meat and fiber and honey and from all these thousands of thousand acres that are sitting around choked with buckthorn. So with that, Arlo, Great, thank you so much for uh, being here today and really interested to learn about your organization. So uh, thank you, Carl. Thank you, thank you. And why thank don't you, guys you all. Take it away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carl and Katie from SFA and, and all of you guys for being here. Um, 
this is such a joy for me to be able to be with you guys. So great to see so many familiar names in all of the little uh, brown square or black squares there. Uh, and Mary Ellen just signed on. Hi, Mary Ellen, if that's you Hi. there. Hi, thank you for being here. This is so sweet. And so many others, Colleen and Helen, and Peter, and all these folks. So I'm here to talk about our uh, our, our deal, our little deal. We, I, my wife and I own Cannon Valley Grazers. Uh, well, I guess let me, I should probably square my, share my screen here. I've got a, a whole... A little presentation set up one second here and people Steve. feel free to put questions in the chat or yeah or you know raise, what? Your, raise yeah, your hand I, or... I probably won't see them if they go in the chat you would you guys want to be brave and just unmute yourself here and just chime in if there's yep. ever any questions or thoughts or anything like that i'm all this is a pretty low-key thing for me i'm not a, yep and i can I'm watch not, the I'm chat not a too formal guy by nature so i, I... <laughs> we'll watch the chat for you too well, thank you. I appreciate that, Carl. Yeah, just let me know if there's any any questions along the way. So, um, got to start from the top here. Cannon Valley Grazers. We own Cannon Valley Grazers. Um, um, Cannon Valley Grazers. We are a solar solar grazing company, uh, based in Minnesota, based in Northfield, Minnesota. Uh, working to improve soil water quality um, through regenerative effective and cost-saving vegetation management solutions. And we're going to talk a little bit about our solar grazing stuff a little later on uh, in the presentation. But first, I'm going to kind of start off with a little bit about uh, us and a little bit about how we got started into the world of um, kind of uh, uh, grazing and, and tar targeted grazing here. So hey, Arlo. Yeah. Can you make that uh, full screen? Oh, um, <laughs> great. So a little bit about us. Um, I grew up in Northfield. I grew up out just outside of Northfield on a small farm. Um, and my wife, Josie, uh, grew up out in the state of Washington. Oops, don't want to go there forward yet. Uh, grew up out in the state of Washington um, on uh, her grandparents' uh, a cattle ranch, a small 100-acre uh, ranch, um, doing rotational uh, grazing with cattle and, and hay out there. Um, so, you know, we uh, both have backgrounds in agriculture, agriculture and conservation and ecology. We actually met uh, out in the state of Maine, going to college at a small little school called College of the Atlantic on the coast. Um, and uh, decided, uh, you know, that we wanted to move back to Northfield after we graduated. Um, and uh, knew that we wanted to farm when we got back here. Um, we, we had this, we knew when we came back, we had a vision that we wanted to uh, uh, grow grow sheep. I had had some had some experience out in Maine working with some livestock, and obviously with Josie's background as well. Uh, we knew that we wanted to get into sheep, and we had the vision of providing really high quality products, high quality lamb and wool products to our community. Um, and we also knew that we did want we wanted to have some sort of positive impact on the ecology and the soil health of the Cannon River Valley. This area, it's right Northfield is kind of nestled right in the center of the Cannon River Valley. So, uh, um, you know, when we move back, obviously there's a lot of, lot of challenges that beginning farmers like ourselves face. Uh, and, and maybe arguably the largest one in our state uh, is land access. Um, land and, and uh, you know, when we moved back, we, we didn't have a whole lot of money. And we don't have family farm with land at, uh, you know, we don't have family that farm in this area. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we, was a real challenge for us was how are we going to figure out, um, you know, what, what uh, where we're going to farm, where are we going to raise these animals? And so, um, you know, actually, as, as a result of having a really, you know, beautiful and tight-knit community here in, um, in the Northfield area, uh, we were able to get in touch with uh, Mary Ellen Frame's family. Uh, and I'm so glad to see that she was on this call because she's a real central part of our farm story. Um, and that, that farm is called Larch Hill Farm. It's nestled right, it's about, uh, now it's about uh, maybe 15 acres, um, just right north of Northfield on Highway 3. Um, let's see here. Um, oh, back it up, Arlo, back it up. So yeah, about three, uh, 15 acres uh, north of uh, Highway, or 15 acres north of Highway, north of Northfield on Highway 3. Um, and, uh, you know, we uh, knew that we were, we, we had kind of done some grazing here on a, a pasture that had kind of been overgrown um, there. And, and we knew that we were going to have to try to figure out a, a, some more creative solutions as we wanted to scale our business. 
Um, so uh, right around the time that uh, we were starting this, this, our business in 2018, uh, there was a lot of talk and the Ecological Livestock Service Network was doing a lot of outreach on uh, this goat grazing. And Carl talked a lot about it, that in the introduction. Um, so folks like Goat Dispatch and Fairbo, MGM, Munch Bunch, um, uh, Minnesota Native Landscapes, a, a few other big players in the area uh, have been using uh, livestock uh, goats to uh, have this huge positive impact on the forest ecosystems. And I was seeing that um, kind of all around us in Northfield and, and um, was really, we both, Josie and I were feeling really inspired by that. We thought, man, what, what a great example of uh, what a positive impact can look like, you know, what a positive impact that livestock have and how that looks a very tangible example. Um, so, uh, you know, when we were thinking about our, um, you know, how to apply sheep to the Northfield area and thinking about what, where, where are sheep, the question that came right. to mind is, well, where are sheep going to be most effective? Um, and, you know, we had a few different ideas uh, and kind of as we, as we grew the flock, the first few years started to build more relationships with folks in the area uh, that wanted, that wanted to have us around and, and wanted to have our sheep. They saw what we were doing and, and uh, they could see that, um, you know, could see that we, we were holding out this vision and wanted to kind of have this, have this impact in this way. And so, um, you know, the three, the three uh, first, you know, the three kind of some of the first projects that we started on, which I got listed right up here, um, which is the first is clearing overgrown forests and pastures. Um, we also started out doing some native prairie disturbance management and uh, we did some orchard grazing as well. Oh my gosh, excuse me, you guys, sorry. So here's uh, a couple photos of Larch Hill Farm, Mary of the Frames Place. Um, kind of on the left, there's the, I guess, what is the, um, the eastern part of the property, which is an old growth um, walnut uh, kind of civil pasture area um, that in certain areas, the, there's new walnuts that were come up and uh, kind of along the edges, there's a lot of briars that had grown in along the fence line. Um, and then on the right hand side over here, uh, it's Josie kind of in the westernmost part of the, uh, the land which has walnuts, you can kind of see some walnuts over here, um, but has become really overgrown. Um, and, and we, uh, so we wanted to see what we could, what the sheep could do in this area. We saw, we thought, well, goats are doing this, let's see what sheep can do. Um, so um, we also knew uh, that this was also, it, parts, of, parts of this area were really uh, sensitive. There's some uh, pretty rare spring ephemerals growing in these kind of uh, grown over spots. And there was a lot of desirable uh, shrubs and, and different kinds of uh, native species as well, some elderflower and some things like that uh, that, we, that we wanted to keep around. So, um, so we, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of a first little spot about there. Um, there's also, I'm sorry, a lot of buckthorn, a lot of other, and a lot of garlic mustard in this area as well, um, which has been, I know there's been lots of problems with those two species in other places too. Um, here we're at Keepsake, Keepsake Cidery, doing some orchard grazing. Um, this is, this is a photo of us. Uh, this is our third year grazing, um, at, at, uh, Keepsake Cidery. Um, they, uh, you know, one of the, one of the problems uh, about, of climate change that we're kind of realizing and that is, and we're facing here in Minnesota is uh, a little 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 bug called the S S W D, the spotted wing Drosophila. Um, and I don't know, it's kind of maybe a nerd nerdoid thing, but uh, their spotted wing Drosophilas can live in different kinds of fruit plants, uh, along with many different other kinds of uh, pests and invasives. Um, and uh, the drop, they live in the drops of the apples on the ground, and so you know usually. Um, at the end of the season, the, all the drops would be gathered or stomped down or mowed. Um, but what the uh, sheep were able to do is actually go in and manage the vegetation really nicely underneath the trees and also uh, eat the apples, which I've got a little video of. I'm not sure if that's working for you guys, but uh, um, that's one of, our, well, one of our girls eating, going after a, an apple. I wish I could tell you the variety. I, I, it's always <laughs> such, a, such a, a beautiful thing getting to be in the orchard um at keepsake and and i don't know if you guys have ever been there anybody's ever been there but it's a beautiful space i really recommend checking it out oh let's see if i can uh, just skip ahead to the next so um and then here are some different photos um 
of there's on the far right is another photo of keepsake cidery. Um, and uh, then on the far left is a prairie ecosystem that we were doing some grazing in. Um, as you can kind of see, there's a lot of uh, goldenrod that has come up. This was a pretty imbalanced system that hadn't been burned in many, many years. Um, and a lot of trees growing up through it as well. Um, excuse me. And so we were able to bring the sheep in um, and uh, kind of teach them over the course of a few seasons uh, to um, go after this goldenrod. It kind of took a little while for them to understand. That 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 was What's that? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was wondering where where is that uh, prairie that they're grazing? Great question. That's, uh, that's a, a, a parcel out kind of nearby Lonsdale. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, out near Lonsdale, about 15 Just minutes curious. from Lonsdale. Yeah, great, thank you. That's awesome. Um, and then here is a, a photo of, uh, in the center is uh, some yarrow and uh, some gray-headed coneflower uh, that was actually left behind during a, a prairie graze after, um, uh, in a different location, just north of Northfield in a, a different spot. Uh, so we've, we've kind of worked in a number of different areas and, and kind of uh, spent a lot of different time testing different kinds of, uh, you know, different types of grazing, different lengths and durations and, uh, and, and uh, things like that. Um, so let's see here. So um, that's kind of a, a brief overview of some of our early projects. I know we did they, they, we did uh, a bunch of different things. It definitely you know it's kind of hard to compact all of the work that we did into a, a little thing. But I figured that uh, you know really there's some pretty key takeaways, uh, the three that I want to leave you guys with, um, and that that uh, from just kind of um, our experience, what we some things that we've noticed. And the first is that um, you know in forest ecosystems, sheep are almost effective as goats. Um, but there's a few important differences. Um, you know, they, they don't girdle uh, trees. So, uh, you know, in some ways it's kind of can be a drawback depending on what the application is, right? If you have a lot of buckthorn, a lot of briars, a lot of things that really need uh, really heavy pressure, goats are really a great solution. But in a situation like maybe like Mary Ellen's uh, place, um, uh, you know, not having the trees girdle uh, not having them, uh, not having the trees girdled, not having, you know, in more sensitive ecosystems, uh, sheep can be a really, uh, you know, effective solution. Um, and over the long term, uh, you know, we've seen some really drastic uh, changes in those, uh, in, in those spaces. Um, the second, second, one of the second takeaways uh, is that when, that when rotationally grazed sheep are uh, very helpful in restoring and maintaining that native prairie uh, ecosystems. And, and uh, the folks over at Minnesota Native Landscapes are currently um, uh, in the process of doing a biodiversity study. I know there's been a lot of, a lot of different studies done with larger ruminants, um, the uh, bison and the cows uh, in, in prairie ecosystems. And uh, many of those studies have shown uh, that uh, when, when rotationally grazed and, and done thoughtfully, uh, there, there's a, a, a great benefit to the uh, pollinator ecosystems that those, those spaces are. Um, and really the third and biggest takeaway is that, you know, grazing practices, um, excuse me, guys, I'm going, this is going crazy here. Grazing practices, uh, uh, deter really it's the grazing practice that determines the positive or negative ecological impact on any environment, right? So that, um, you know, if you, it's really, there's no, there's really no bad sheep. There's only a bad grazer, I guess you could say that, that you know, you really think you, when you're thinking about um, how, how to meet the needs of a space and meet the, meet the goals and the vegetation management goals of a space, um, you have to take in a lot of considerations, um, including, you know, stocking density and frequency of rotation and all, all of the, uh, the vegetation that's present. Um, all, there's many different kinds of things. And I'm not, I'm not going to get too deep into that, but uh, if you have any questions about those types of things, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask. I'm happy to share my experience. And if I don't know the answer, <clears throat> point you towards somebody that does. Yeah, maybe so, uh, take yeah. a little break here. Uh, if there's any questions so far, or people forget what we're talking about here, uh, please feel free to chat or or raise your hand. Um, uh, so uh, go ahead, uh, Arlo. Great. So, um, so a couple of years ago, I was introduced um, to the concept of solar grazing. Um, 
which is the practice of using livestock to manage the vegetation underneath solar arrays. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have seen all of the arrays going up all, all around in, in uh, you know, rural Minnesota. Um, and, and so most of these sites traditionally are, are mowed. They're um, treated with herbicide if there's invasive species or noxious weeds that come up. Um, and so, you know, solar grazing is a, a, a really effective alternative, can be a really effective alternative to some of these more conventional uh, vegetation management strategies. So um, when we first, when we first uh, learned about it, I was introduced to an organization called the American Solar Grazing Association and a lady by the name of Lexi Hain, uh, who lives out east. Uh, the, the organization is kind of based in, in, um, in New England uh, and it's a, it's a not-for-profit trade association founded for and managed by sheep farmers who became solar grazers. So ASCA members are developing the best practices that support shepherds and solar developers to both effectively manage solar installations and create new agribusiness profits. So the way I really see it uh, is that ASCA really inter exists at the intersection of agriculture, sustainable energy, and land use. Um, there's a lot of different, uh, yeah, and, and, uh, agriculture, sustainable energy, and land use. <laughs> so our work, um, let's see if I can go back here. So um, how, how this works, how does it work? How do you, how do you, how do you solar graze? So you, the, the idea is that you're bringing sheep to a solar site um, and you're leaving them there for a, a certain amount of time and then you're removing the sheep from the site. That's at least how we're doing it. Uh, there's a few different kind of strategies that people use to manage uh, these solar sites. Some folks out east um, uh, will put a small amount of sheep on a site for a long time. Uh, some folks like us and, and uh, like Minnesota Native Landscapes um, are trying to do high density grazes uh, for really short bursts. Bah! And um, that gives the, the pasture, or I'm sorry, excuse me, that gives the ground cover a long time to uh, uh, kind of recuperate. Uh, and that's really important, especially uh, with native uh, plants, uh, ecosystems and pollinator ecosystems uh, for those, those um pollinators and native grasses to have a long time to rebound a long rest period. Um, so, you know, our, our, the work, this work is regenerative, regenerative, right? This work is returning nutrients to the soil, which leads to carbon sequestration and also a, he a healthier vegetative cover. Um, this work is effective. It is an effective solution to, uh, you know, a, a uh, it, it meets a market demand, I guess is what I'm trying to say, that there's a lot of solar sites coming up and, and uh, they all need to be either mowed or have the, the vegetation managed some way or another. So, and, um, you know, because of a uh, low labor and overhead, uh, we're able to position ourselves really competitively in the market, right? This is, this is a paid grazing service. So we're able to come at or below what it costs to mow these sites and uh, do a better job. And, I'll, and I can talk a little bit more about that in a little while here. So I've got a, couple, a few. I got yeah. a couple questions. Yeah, great. Um, I'm just curious how many sheep you run, and then uh, uh, are these solar sites usually fenced off, or do you bring your own uh, fencing? Yeah, great question. Um, right now, we have about 65 ewes, um, and um, and they're lambs, and so it's not a huge flock, but we're going to be expanding pretty significantly over the next couple of years. Um, we're kind of in the last few years we've been in sort of the the pilot. A project phase of uh, with a few developers kind of as you add develop as we've been adding developers to our portfolio um we have uh, kind of been introducing them slowly a lot of times developers will say well let's try it for a year and see how it works and so we haven't needed we haven't needed to expand our uh, flock to be a huge size yet uh because we're still kind of in those in in the beginning stages of working with uh certain developers um and all all the solar sites are fenced um they we've been working on five to ten acre sites um, and been leaving our sheep there for about two weeks. And that has been sufficient uh, for them to manage the for them to manage the spaces. And, and in the future, you know, depending on uh, kind of the size of the sites and how many sheep we have in, in certain locations, um, you know, we, we think that it may be it may be useful to use kind of an, a temporary electric polynet to kind of subdivide, create paddocks within the solar sites. Um, but depending on how the solar site is laid out, that can kind of pose its own problems. Oftentimes, it's really hard to kind of weave 
uh, uh, the, those net those net fences in between the panels and underneath and all those types of things. So um, yeah, does that sort of answer your question there? Great. Yeah. So um, these are some sheep on solar sites. So, you know, one of my one of my deep regrets about this last season is this that I did not take enough photos. Uh, so I'm doing my best to get you guys as many photos as I can here from a sort of limited uh, a limited catalog. Um, but as you can see here. Um, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of vegetation on the site. Uh, most of these sites are actually planted out with uh, native pollinator systems. Um, and they, those kind of, those different um, kind of seed mixes, they sort of come in all different shapes and sizes. Some are heavier on grasses in certain areas. Some are heavier on pollinator uh, uh, plants. And, and uh, sometimes even they'll have different types of mixes in different parts of the arrays. Uh, where there'll be like a lower line, heavier in grass mix uh, beneath the array itself. And then on the perimeter, you'll have a taller, um, uh, palm, more pollinator friendly species, a uh, mix of species. Is. Um, so as you can kind of see, uh, the, you know, the sheep aren't eating the stems, but they're defoliating the leaves and creating, uh, you know, uh, putting pressure on uh, any existing weeds. On this particular site, there is um, probably two acres of, uh, of um, ragweed that was taller than I am, and the sheep uh, demolished it. <laughs> they they went they they did a great job with it, um, and kind of just you could hardly tell that the you know they they break the stems off and kind of defoliate all the stems. So there's all these broken uh, ragweed kind of uh, stems, um, and <clears throat> here's another picture of that same site. As you can see, Carl, there's that uh, that perimeter fence. There's a lot of different kinds of perimeter fences. Some are like chain link, some are post and um, uh, kind of post and mesh. Um, some have barbed wire, some don't. So it just kind of the fencing kind of depends on um, the the county. Usually, there's different kinds of county requirements. Here's a little bit about. Uh, when I said before we do a better job, you can kind of see here what I mean. On the left um, is a photo of, well, on the left and the right, this, these are two sites um, that were managed right next to each other. Um, the, the one on the left was mowed, as you can kind of see recently mowed, the, you, got, you can see all the lawn clippings there. Um, and on the right, oops, excuse me. Uh, on the right uh, over here, you can see it was grazed. Um, and the difference, <clears throat> you know, can be pretty drastic in terms of the amount of hours it takes to manage these things, these uh, amount of person hours. Um, you know, if you have lots of, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have lots of tall woody shrubs, trees, uh, over time, those things grow up through the panels and they have to become, they have to come through um, and manually string trim, or you have to herbicide. A lot of times underneath the panels will just get sprayed. Um, and so this, you know, on the right here, is a great example of kind of showing uh, the kind of work that our sheep are able to do, right? This is kind of a proactive strategy in terms of vegetation management, um, where our sheep are able to move freely and easily underneath the panels and, and manage the vegetation under there um, without issue at all. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to mention here too, is that really what we're doing is, uh, you know, part of the work that we're doing here is telling a story um, you know, we're, we're telling a story about land use in Minnesota. And, um, you know, if you go to, <clears throat> you know, many, I, I oftentimes when I'm in my conversations with developers, I'm, I'm uh, solar developers, I'm, um, I, I talk to them and I say, well, I, you know, I, I, I have relationships with uh, all of the, all of the, the township board members in my area and, and, you know, solar hesitancy is a real thing. And if we're going to, you know, we're gonna, um, if, if we're going to, uh, move through climate change here and create a real uh, sustainable future for ourselves as a state. Uh, solar power, I see solar power as one of the main uh, 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 solutions to, you know, kind of creating a green economy here. And so, you know, this is really, I, I think in, in a lot of ways, people can see that at odds with uh, some some more rural, val rural values, which is, well, we love, we love our uh, land and agriculture and we have a lot of pride in our corn and soy. And, um, you know, why would we take good land out of ag? Um, I've got a lot of qualms with that as a, uh, a you know, uh, <laughs> on a whole other level, but, uh, you know, as far as, as far as what we're talking about right now, um, 
you know, this is, a, this is a way that we can work with rural townships to keep land in agriculture and also have a positive impact on soil and ecology of our townships, of our counties, and of our state more broadly. Um, and we can also create a, a really <clears throat> important energy source for ourselves in the state as well. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, that's a really important point, and we're going to have to be super aware of this. I mean, same thing with wind turbines and solar panels. They're wonderful, but you've been living someplace your whole life and then you look across the road and it's 200 acres of solar panels, you know, that's an issue. So we have to be really aware of these things. Right. It is. Yeah. And I, I think that it's, um, I think really what I'm, what I'm talking about here is trying to build strong relationships, right? We're trying to build strong relationships between um, our, uh, between everybody. <laughs> and that means that people, you know, we want to be able to talk and have, uh, you know, share, share our goals and try to reach people uh, from all different kinds of backgrounds. And if that means, um, you know, if, if, if people are, are, are more open to solar, um, if they're able to see sheep on it and keep the land in agriculture, I think that there's actually some real tangible value there in terms of what is actually unlockable for the solar industry. Um, you know, the, there's many townships that uh, are won't won't take calls from solar developers who might, if if the solar developers were actively approaching them, saying, "Hey, listen, we're keeping this land in agriculture. This land's going to be taxed at an agricultural rate. Your taxes aren't going to go up, and uh, and we get to have clean energy and and our need, our needs get met as well." So, um, so just that, yeah, just a quick uh, that is a quick word on that. Um, so yeah, just talking a little bit more about the broader benefits of solar grazing in Minnesota. Like I mentioned, it has a it has the potential of a really broad impact on soil health throughout the state. Um, you know, it's it, rotational grazing is as well proven. It's it's well understood that uh, if that intentional rotational grazing has a tremendous impact on um, on soil health. Uh, it keeps land in agricultural production um, with the ad and and also you know as we're as we're learning. Uh, has added and keep, keeps added benefit, keeps the, excuse me, keeps the added benefit of the politic, pollinator habitat, uh, returns the ruminants to the land. Um, and third and finally, which is another really important thing that I didn't mention in the last slide, um, is that it provides folks like me with an alternative uh, uh, revenue stream, it's an alternative source of income, right? Um, that, it, you know, anybody that knows or is uh, around uh, sheep, <clears throat> sheep farmers, knows about the price of wool right now um and and they know how hard it's been uh you know the last 20 years to make any money with farm, farm and sheep at all um it's a it's a real struggle and i know a lot of guys that are struggling really hard um and so this is a real uh a really big opportunity uh for folks <clears throat> um like me new farmers old farmers that are running sheep um to be able to diversify their income streams um, and uh, helps promote the viability of, you know, both large and small uh, scale sheep operations. And I think that's a, a really valuable thing in terms of, um, you know, uh, our agricultural heritage as a state. Um, yeah, and let's see. The final thing that I wanted to mention about, speaking of revenue streams, uh, this is a very exciting thing. These are, these are two new logos for two um, kind of uh, additional enterprises that we're adding on kind of separate from Cannon Valley Grazers. Um, uh, so Cannon Valley Grazers being a, uh, a vegetation management company, uh, Tethera Farm being uh, our, our, our new meat uh, brand, and Bale uh, LLC uh, being a, a, wool, a wool and goods company. So this, there's a lot of opportunities uh, to kind of create uh, solar raised products in our, in our state uh, and create a kind of a new, a develop a new market uh, for um, uh, a, a kind of a new, a new market for goods that are raised on in conjunction with these sites on these dual use sites. Hey, Arlo. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question here for you. Gary yeah, wants great. to know, Gary wants to know, have you noticed any difference in sheep breeds in grazing in woodlands or silver pasture? Eating buckthorn, honeysuckle, etc. <clears throat> Great question. Um, yeah, yeah, I absolutely have. <laughs> um, I have two kind of thoughts there. The first thought is breed specific. Um, primitive breeds act more like goats. I've noticed. Um, so you're thinking about. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different kinds of primitive breeds out there, um, kind of like a black belly or, um, uh, you know, there's a few, kind of a few different kinds of uh, hair sheep 
Um, they just, they, yeah, they're, they're kind of more goat-like. They get up on their hind legs a little more. They're kind of a little bit more aggressive on the plants um, versus, uh, you know, like a polypay uh, probably won't hardly do any browsing at all. Um, so there's, it, just in my experience, and obviously, you know, the second part of this thought that I have is um, that really it's <clears throat> really flock specific, I would argue as well, that you can really train a flock over the course of multiple years to target uh, different species. Um, and I've got a couple examples of that, um, which is the first being the, the, which I mentioned, something I mentioned earlier, the goldenrod um, out at that Lonsdale site. Uh, you know, the first season that we were there, uh, they ate it, but not until the very end. The second season there, they were a little more eager. Uh, and then the third season we were there, they went straight for it. Um, and at the end of that third season, we, you know, by the time the fourth season came around, we were like, great, this is, this is, this feels like it's been uh, well balanced and we didn't have to return. Uh, and the same, <clears throat> the same goes for garlic mustard uh, at Mary Ellen Frame's place. Um, garlic mustard all over the understory of this one particular area. The first year they didn't touch it. Second year they kind of nibbled. And then the third year, bam, they went right for it. Um, so I, I, I don't know, does that sort of answer your question? Does that sort of answer your question there, Gary? Or um, Great. And, Thanks, and feel free to unmute and chime in if you'd like. Gary wants to ask a question. Um, yeah. Um, how do you train them? It's just you expose them is, is all it takes or um, do you confine them to an area where that's all there is to eat, or how do you how do you train them to go for things like uh, garlic mustard and goldenrod and so on? Yeah, yeah, a combination. Yeah, it's exposure. It's an ex it's exposure and confinement. You you get somebody hungry enough, and they'll kind of eat it. You know, <laughs> like that. You're thinking about rotational grazing, right? And you you so one of that one of the principles of rotational grazing is a really important principle is is uh, stocking density, right? And so you're thinking yeah. about wanting to move your sheep, you put, you were thinking about wanting to place the correct amount of sheep for the size of space that you have um, and rotate them as for, you know, on a, on a certain, certain rotation. And so the goal is to have all of the sheep eat everything down in one area and then move them to the next uh, space. And so, uh, you know, I, at Large Hill Farm, uh, you know, that was exactly what we did. We, the first season we were there, we moved them in really small paddocks yeah. uh, very, very frequently every other day. Um, to kind of get them to uh, one get as much nutrition out of the space as possible, but to also eat have a, as consistent of a graze as possible. I got a question: the water. So, how much water do you bring each day, or do you? Do, I mean, sixty-five head. You're probably bringing two hundred gallons of water a day to them. Yeah, uh, uh, not quite that much. We figure they go through about a gallon of water a day. Seems like. Um, so when we when we do solar sites, we've got a trailer system with a 300 gallon tank on it, uh, and we fill that up. We'll, I, they seem they don't seem to go through it much more than every one. We fill it up maybe once every five six days or so. Um, so uh, that that's been about what we been about uh, what we do. Um, but you know, obviously every every flock's a little different. Some are thirstier, and some if it's hotter. And you know, one of the things about one of the things about solar grazing too is that there's actually a lot less stress on the animals. Um, uh, we can go back here and I can show you um, shade. the we, shade exactly. We got a, you can we got see, you can see the shade. They they love the shade. And this was this it was 102 degrees out today and perfectly comfortable with the breeze underneath that underneath that panel right there. So um, yeah, they're, they're, it's it's actually really uh, I've noticed that they they don't seem they don't they don't seem to mind uh, and they don't go through as much water when they have that much. Um, the goats solar. love the solar; it's shaded. They they don't, but yeah, water is my biggest concern going into this. Is yeah, right, right. Well, I think there's a lot of different systems for water. You know, I you know, people, um, you know, we like our system where you have you're able to have it on a trailer and then kind of move the trailer. Uh, from site to site. Uh, some people have tanks that they leave on site. Um, so there's a lot of different, there's kind of a lot of different ways of doing it. Yeah. Corey, why don't you say a few words about what, what do you have, your operation? If you don't mind. Uh, my, my operation? So we have 300 boar goats right now. We, I was taken under the philosophy that I'd build my own solar farm. So I've been building, I got uh, 38 kilowatts right now going in with the third 18 kilowatt and i the solar grazing uh lexi there that i got interested with that i then i went to the minnesota uh 
met Arlo at the Minnesota uh, Solar Conference. Um, I'm more looking at it for something to do when I retire. So I, I thought it would take a lot longer to get involved, but it seems like it's going faster than um, I anticipated. So I'm, we're trying to get water ready and uh, we, we're trying to bid on some stuff and trying to get going on it. So I just, it's going to be excellent. It's, yeah, it's that's going awesome. pretty fast. I, I think we're going to go back more into sheep, but because people are a little less uh, willing to put goats on solar, which I can prove to them that they leave it alone as long as they, if you don't overgraze it, they'll leave the right. solar panels alone. They, they right. won't mess with them that much. But if right. you leave them long term, they will get bored mm -hmm. and start chewing on stuff. But Right, totally. And Corey, totally. Uh, where, Corey, where are you located then? Uh, the farm is in Cannon Falls, but I'm a, I'm a North Dakota kid. Uh, grew, okay. up, grew up with uh, three, 400 head of sheep growing up. <clears throat> We don't have them anymore. We rented it. We we're one of the few people that gave up on them years ago. <laughs> but it's been rough. Excellent. Yeah. Well, one thing, one thing we talked about, I'm working with a solar bunch of folks on the habitat and, and the grazing. And, you know, when we're setting up these solar arrays, it'll be important that they get set up for livestock to come and go. Right, and that, that was exactly big, my thought, Carl, yeah. Big enough gates, uh, access to water, mm -hmm. so that it just becomes super easy. Um, question here from Joan, uh, what do you notice about weeds and burrs in fleeces? Great question. So we <laughs> run a uh, breed of sheep called Rambouillet, um, super fine fleece. I don't know if we have any fleece freaks in the audience, maybe Jake Benz. Uh, but uh, they're real, real fine, real, real fine fleece. Um, and uh, we have been working with uh, kind of a industrial mill um, out in the state of Wyoming. Um, and they don't really care about the, the burrs and the fleece. It just kind of gets picked out uh, in their machines. Uh, we don't really sell fleeces to um, hand spinners or anything like that. So kind of on scale, um, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not too concerned about, <clears throat> uh, kind of junk in the fleece, uh, weed chaff or, or things like that. Um, in the winter time, a lot of times when they're eating hay, uh, out of the feeders, they get a lot of, um, uh, kind of like, like bits of hay and stuff on the back of their neck. And so, yeah, it, it hasn't ever really bothered, uh, the people that we send their fleece to. That sort of answer your question, Joan? Great. Yeah, actually, we do sell um, wool to hand spinners, and this year we put our sheep on on prairie, um, yeah. prairie that hadn't ever been burned, yeah. and I was really distressed at the number of burrs that ended up in the fleeces. Um, right. Yeah, mostly, and I think that mostly thistle stems. But oh, interesting. Yeah, that's and, that's got to be tough for hand spinners. Yikes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, I coat the fleeces in the winter, but I. I think we maybe are going to have to start coating the fleeces um, year round. I think, you know, if you're, if you're selling those, I think that to hand spinners, I think that sometimes that, that can be a good solution, uh, you know, coating, coating year round. And I think that also <clears throat> over time, really, depending on what your situation is, um, you know, the objective is to eliminate those species, right? Uh, you know, like over time, we need to be taking steps to uh, kind of mitigate, uh, mitigate the the thistle, mitigate the um, the burdock, those types of those types of uh, um, uh, undesirables. Um, uh, and I think you know, um, if if you are implementing rotational grazing practices, I know that that can be really helpful in kind of the long term um, uh, kind of pasture and and prairie health of of spaces. So uh, yeah, just a thought there, but. Um, I totally understand. Yeah, I totally understand. Yeah, when it comes to the hand spinning stuff, that's a tough one. Any other thoughts there before we move on? I think I'm getting close to the end here, you guys. Um, yeah. Hey, look at that. That's the end. How about that? Huh? Great. <laughs> well, <laughs> Carlo, I was going <clears> to <throat> just ask you then uh, looking forward. Yeah. You mentioned getting some more sheep. Uh, what are the plans um, for the next, let's say, five years? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, next season we have um, about 85 acres of solar sites lined up uh, for, for grazing. Um, actually, probably a little bit more than that, probably about 100 now. Um, and as we, and, and, at the, and the year after that, uh, yet more yet. And so we're kind of the, over the course of the next five years, we're hoping to scale up 
uh, the size of the flock. Um, and uh, eventually within the next five years, hopefully be looking at um, uh, utility scale uh, sites and grazing large amounts of sheep, thousands of sheep on uh, utility scale sites. So um, that's a great that's a great question. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, lots of um, lots of lots of plans. <laughs> so uh, so Mary has a question. Then, are you doing any grazing outside of solar sites? Uh, targeted grazing, you mean, Mary? Like yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I. Um, yeah, we're not, not too much anymore. We're doing a little bit on some rented, some rented land. Uh, we've been doing a little bit of pasture, uh, I'm sorry, prairie management on a, on a piece of rented land. Um, but most of, most of the grazing we did this season was on solar, um, and will continue to be on solar. Um, yeah. And then Joan asks, what do we charge for the utility? And that's a great question. Um, that's a really good question. There's, a uh, a lot of um, the American Solar Grazing Association has done a, a really great study. I'm going to type it in to uh, check that link out, everybody. Solargrazing.org. And if you go there, they've got a really great um, they've got a really great page. Uh, I think it's the resources page. And there's a study that was put on. I think with maybe it was with Cornell University, um, kind of looking at the cost, what it costs solar grazers to graze. Um, and, and kind of how to figure out how to price um, different, uh, you know, how to, how to price your acreage, depending on kind of where you are geographically and what um, kind of what the market is, uh, you know, uh, designating. So right, right now we have kind of a range that we're charging. Um, right, I believe that, it, you know, kind of on the low end, we're, we're probably around $250 an acre, and it kind of ranges up to $350 an acre, depending on uh, what, um, what, where, where we are, what the site, what the site is looking like, how access, how a readily available access is, um, what the uh, species composition is, what the goals are. So we take a lot of, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not, we don't really just have a blanket rate that we use. We take a lot of uh, um, different, uh, uh, you know, kind of considerations um, into account when we're making, when we're, when we're placing bids. Um, yeah, Mary Ellen. Um, uh, do you want to say something about uh, what you do in the winter with the sheep? Yeah, great question. We, um, I should have thrown some slides in there. We do um, uh, what's called bale grazing um, <clears throat> most of the most of the winter months. Um, so, on the site that we uh, the site that we currently are renting and the sheep live at through the winter months. Um, it was is recently turned into kind of a clover a grass pasture mix. Um, and previously, previous to that mix, it had been farmed corn and soy. And so the soil is extremely degraded. Um, it's on a hillside. So on the top of the hill, or actually sort of on a, a long hill with some different knolls, I guess. And on the tops of those knolls, we're down to sub, subsoil. Uh, there's no topsoil at all left on many of those hills tops. So um, what, um, you know, one, one solution to that is what is called bale grazing, where you stick a large round bale out on the high points and the sheep gather around it and they deliver a huge amount of nutrients through their manure um, and they deliver a huge amount of organic matter onto those spots um, uh, with the, you know, as you know, not all the hay gets eaten, some of it gets wasted and put on, on the uh, kind of falls out of the feeders and, and lands on the ground and, and whatnot. So um, yeah, that's kind of what we do in the winter. And then uh, come about mid-February, we bring them into a barn and we shear them for the year and then they lamb and we have babies uh, usually in March and April. So have little lambs in March and April. Yeah. So there's a good question here uh, from Phil. What are the insurance protocols? Yeah, great question. Um, We've got a great insurance agent uh, here in Northfield um, uh, with Farm Bureau. His name is Dan Hummel. Um, I uh, yeah, so different different uh, developers require different insurance um, plans. Um, I believe that we have a two million dollar liability policy, um, and uh, that covers um, you know any damage to the panels that may happen. Uh, is a pretty basic plan uh, that's required of most subcon all subcontractors that work on these sites, anybody, any electricians, any 
anybody that would mow it, um, those types of things. So um, it, it was a little bit, it was a little bit interesting kind of asking him, um, you know, like, hey, how do I, uh, do, would you insure this? <laughs> and he kind of had to look around for somebody to underwrite it, but he found, he did end up finding somebody and um and yeah so we that's that's how that's how we are insured the the, uh, the the solar developers require um require it how long is the grazing season great question we start in may and we go till um uh, october november depends on the year i mean these last few years the falls have gone so long uh that we've been out we're out, I mean, it just depends, you know, like we, we start putting out bales when there's no food left on the ground for them in this area that they're in. So we put out our first bales for them, oh, maybe, maybe three weeks ago. So, um, so yeah, kind of transitioning away from, from like grazing, like you see on, in this area to bale, bale grazing. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Mary, Mary's got a fun question here. Do you use a dog to round up the sheep when they're Mary. done on a site? Come, come here. Oh, Mary. Well, there come you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's on the ground. I'd, I'd show I, she's laying down here. Right come on. Come here. Oh, come on. Oh, punker. This is crazy. It's our little border collie. Um, she's just a pup. She doesn't do very much work. She's helped us move them into the trailers. Uh, so she's got some basic instinctual stuff, but we're working with the dog trainer to give her some structured lessons about going around. That's the concept we're working on right now, going around. So, and she's getting it. So you're going to work into the dog, the, the sheep dogs. Yeah. 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 We, she's about just about a year old. And usually they say anywhere from 10 to 15, 14 months is kind of when they start training up well. So. How'd you do it before now? Sorry. So how did you move them before the dog? A grain bucket. They like it. They like grain. <laughs> okay. they'll, they'll come running. They'll come running when we call them mostly now still, if they know we got a, if no, if we know we got a white bucket on hand and we, we go, come on over sheep. And they, they kind of know they're getting led to greener pastures, right? That, well, that's right. And that's also part of it too, right? That they do know they, these cows. Um, we actually had a smaller group of sheep introduced uh, this season, we got, we got a, a small group of Merinos, um, and they just don't, they just did not get the picture. Everybody else was loading up into the trailer right away. You'd bring them over and you say, come on over. And they'd run up and jump in the trailer because they know that they get the drill, you know, they're hungry and they get it. And these darn Merinos, they are just running all over the place, not loading up, not bunching up. Right. So, um, when I was talking earlier about like the, 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 the like teaching sheep, how to graze different kinds of uh, plants. I think the same goes for these, you know, the, these other types of things like loading into trailers. Um, I know I've talked to a lot of goat guys that have a very similar experience. The first, you know, the first year, uh, if you have sheep or I'm sorry, if you have goats that you get new the first year is really tough. And then the second season, they start to kind of get the picture. Oh yeah. Got to go into the trailer to get food. So. Neat. Hey, here's another question. Uh, is it, do you have other employees or is it just the two of you? Just Josie and I for now. Yeah, yeah. and for Izzy. She's kind of our, our other employee or em, employee in training <laughs> here. Um, but yeah, no, just us, we do. We provide 100% of the labor for the farm and the, <clears throat> the solar grazing stuff. So we, um, uh, yeah, and I think as we continue to scale, we'll probably be ending up bringing on a few employees, people to run trucks and trailers and, and, um, and things like that, um, you know, in the, next, in the next few years. Excellent. So lots of uh, things to consider. Yeah, great questions, everybody. Thank you. This is this is awesome. One thing we talked about early on in this network, uh, uh, kind of from the business development angle and getting people into farming and, and doing the service livestock thing with livestock, obviously, um, is it you know, like any kind of farming or anything, it's not for everybody. And, and a certain kind of person, um, you know, you have to, you have to know livestock and you have to enjoy livestock and, and all of that. And uh, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. I mean, <clears throat> things always look great on paper, but doing them is one thing and 
like farming, you know, if you, you have to enjoy it or you're never going to make it even, even, you know, through the rough spots and there's going to be more of those than you'd like. Right. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Like enjoying handling, being with, working with livestock and for anybody that's considering this. Yeah. I mean, I think that you said it really well, that it really does. Um, you really got to love it, you know? And I think that part of how we've been, you know, I think as, as a, I don't want to say that, that it's too, uh, it's too common <clears throat> that people love it so much that they will go without being paid for it. Um, <laughs> it you know, that it, that it's, that it's, it's such a love, it's such a loving, a labor of love. It's such a family tradition. Um, you know, it, and it, it, it seems like as markets continue to get consolidated in, in agriculture throughout the country, um, it is harder and harder for small guys and gals to, to make a decent living uh, doing it. And so, um, you know, my goal and my hope for livestock producers is to, is uh, for Minnesota and for the rest of the Midwest and the rest of the country, um, my, my hope is that we can all figure out creative uh, solutions to the problem of not being able to pay ourselves well. Um, and we need to, we need to know that our work is valuable and we need to know, uh, that we're skilled and that we bring a lot of value to the world and, and to people's tables. Um, and, and to kind of a broader conversation around ecology and, and, and natural, uh, restoration processes. So, um, you know, I think that yes, you got to love it. And also you can't love it so much that you settle, uh, you settle for, you know, eating lamb every day of the week, you know, I mean, I love lamb, but like, or mutton every day of the week, you know, it's, it, you gotta, you gotta, um, uh, you gotta be able to, you gotta be able to have a, a make a decent living. And I, I would argue that I think with every, probably with every kind of farming. Yeah. You got to sharpen that pencil. I know, uh, there were some old world war two guys that couldn't look mutton in the face. Cause during the war they got just you know mutton really nasty stuff and yeah, they would never right. look at lamb again <laughs> but look at that picture uh that you have up there sorry uh, sheep sheep great look at that picture you have up there sheep grazing under solar panels 10 20 years ago that wouldn't have been a thing no definitely not yeah. and uh <laughs> diversity 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 and and getting sheep back on the land getting goats out there getting cattle i know uh, brad hines there at the university they've built some panels that are uh strong enough for dairy cattle yeah beautiful i know about that project. Um, yeah. and think what dairy farmers could gain from that and beef farmers for that matter um and so uh to your last kind of uh, thought uh yeah markets 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 you gotta you gotta get paid for what you do and you gotta get paid well and and, and pioneers like you and josie are are figuring it out and it's uh, it's quite exciting to me and 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 wonderful um any other uh, any other questions or thoughts from anybody out there in the in the Zoom world? <laughs> I um okay. I I've been thinking about um, I get these catalogs uh, in the mail with um, clothing you know winter clothing and stuff and they got all this uh, fake uh, fleece. And we know that that fake fleece is getting into the water supply, into the fish. And if we could just convert people to wool, that we'd be so much better. I mean, wool has so many um, characteristics that, that are really uh, important. Um, one is, uh, they're just, it's just really warm. And um, I, I've got a, going to, to thrift stores enough, stuff. I've got a collection of wool sweaters um, <clears throat> because I want to keep warm during the winter. And, uh, and I really don't want to spend my money on fleece. <clears throat> so if we can get, the, get some publicity around the um, disadvantages of that fake stuff and uh, the advantages of real wool, um, I think, you know, that's, that's a job for somebody that's that's uh, good at um promotion and and um and uh organizing and stuff like that but 
Um, Are I you talking about the, the microfibers, the microplastics? Yeah, the microfibers, uh-huh, yeah. You know, who knew recycling and making these beautiful clothing out of plastic, what a great idea, but then there's always unintended consequences. Exactly. And of course, wool is how we stayed warm in the far north and far south yeah, <laughs> in the winter. Yeah. Sure. Uh, great comment. Yeah. I have a comment uh, or question, yes. maybe that that sure, I toss out toss out to the group here, with respect to uh, the point you made just a minute ago about you know getting people interested, in getting started. Um, I've been at this a while, and I have a rather um, deep seated sentiment that I don't believe this is something you should do at home alone. Uh, I, I find one of the um, really necessary ingredients to make any kind of a farming operation work, been involved in lots of them, uh, is to have a support network at least, and hopefully uh, somebody close by where when things go wrong, which as you had indicated invariably do all the time, uh, you have somebody to bounce it off. Nothing's more frustrating than dealing with um, farm issues by yourself. Indeed, uh, Phil, that was great. Um, work with a lot of different farmers over the years and the ones that were successful and and seemed to enjoy it had family and partners and some kind of community because um, yeah you can't do this by yourself um you go nuts and so that's that's a, such a key point in any of these things thank you for that comment yeah that's why we have uh networking groups like this huh carl <laughs> that's right <laughs> Absolutely, and that's the whole point. Um, you can read and learn, you can go to classes and learn, you can get a PhD and whatever, and that's all super good. Um, and you can take a class about finances and you can do all these things, but uh, to get out there and, and uh, stand out in the farmyard and you think, okay, what do I do next with all this information? And uh, uh, it, you gotta learn from, everybody's gonna make mistakes and really nice to learn from somebody else's mistake first. <laughs> <laughs> So there will be a, a solar summit coming up. I think I mentioned that, but it's gonna be in March uh, and it's gonna be virtual. So that's not great, but um, that's what we have for now. Uh, and when uh, we'll, uh, that'll be advertised. I, I don't think there was a date. I think it was just March, but there'll be some interesting uh, discussions there, no doubt. All right, well, anything else for the good of the cause? Arlo, I'd like to thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys so much for being here. I I, I really appreciate it. And, and take down my info if you guys ever had yeah. any, uh, any yeah. questions or comments or thoughts or, or anything like that, or you want to come and see the sheep on a site, uh, just give me a call or an uh, email or whatever. And, and we can, we really want to, um, we'd love to make it happen. And, and so yeah. thank you guys for all. Yeah, no, we'd love to, uh, for all the, love the to help with my back and forth on my presentation going. Scrolling love back. to help with your success. And uh, I'm, Great mustache too, I gotta say. Likewise, buddy, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, um, if there's nothing else, I think we'll wrap it up. Any other final thoughts? Katie, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, uh, check out SFA folks and you can join in there and uh, scroll around our website. And uh, we will see you again, hopefully this summer. Seems like a long way off at this point, but uh, in a couple of weeks, the days will be getting longer. So thanks so much, Arlo, once again, and, and say hi to Josie. And thank you all for joining and your great questions. And have a great evening and uh, bundle up with some wool. <laughs> yeah. Great. Take care, everybody. Thank you.